We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9 if you want to open your Bibles there. And uh, we are, uh, we're going to jump right into it, 2 Samuel chapter 9, kind of by way of introduction to the text today. I heard a story this week, interesting story, a guy, a billionaire, who uh, was talking to his wife, uh, his, his health was failing, um, he'd been a guy who was a self-made man and, and just worked hard. He wasn't, he wasn't born a billionaire, wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. In fact, he was born in very poor, humble circumstances. And so uh, he was a guy that just scrapped and saved for everything. And, uh, and so he told his wife, look, when I die, I want to take it all with me. So I want to be buried and I want you to put all of my money in the coffin with me when, when, when I die. No thought to his wife, not, no thought to his family or to, you know, anything that, that he could do uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, being uh, a philanthropist or being, you know, God-honoring with, with what God had blessed him with. Just, hey, when I die, I want to take it all with me. So, sure enough, the guy dies. And uh, the, the day of the funeral, you know, his wife is sitting there and, and she's got a rather large, you know, shoebox in her lap. And, uh, and so then the, the time comes that, you know, the, the, the viewing, they're getting ready to close the casket, and she, just before they do, she goes up and she places this shoebox in the casket, and they lock it up, and there they go. Now, her friend is with her, and she says to her, you did not follow that, that, that selfish man's uh, command, did you? You didn't, you didn't do what you promised him, did you? She said, oh, absolutely. I, ma- I made a promise. I said that I, that I would do this. And so when he died, I took all of the money and I deposited it in my checking account and I wrote him a check. <laughs> well, here in our text today, we're going to see David keep a promise as well. David has make a, made a promise, we're going to see him keep it, and there's huge implications for us today in 2 Samuel chapter 9, one of the greatest chapters of the entire Bible. Um, and, and what we see here is uh, David keeping his promise and the bigger implication of how God keeps his promise with us. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll jump right into it, verse 1, now David said, is there still anyone who's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness For Jonathan's sake. Now David here, in this season of his life, in this place, he's in the center of God's will. God has blessed him abundantly. He's ascended to the throne. He's defeated all of his enemies round about. He's laying the foundation for his son to build the temple of God. And so he's setting stuff aside and getting all ready for Solomon to do that great work. And David has gotten here by seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, we, we, uh, we hear in Matthew's gospel that uh, Jesus, he was asked this question. He said, hey, what's the most important commandment in all the law? And uh, Jesus answers, he replied, he said, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second, Jesus said, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two Commandments. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that the entire Bible, all 66 books of your Bible, is comprised, this all boils down to these two things, loving God and loving others. Now, this is reflected in the Ten Commandments. If you read through the Ten Commandments, what you find is that the first four commandments pertain to loving God. First commandment, you you only have one God. You worship God and Him only. Second commandment, you don't have any idols. Third commandment, you don't take the Lord's name in vain. Fourth commandment, you remember the Sabbath day and you keep it holy. And these four commandments, the, the first of the ten, all relate to our relationship with God. Now, all the rest of the commandments relate to our relationship with man. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. The sixth commandment, don't murder. Seventh commandment, you, you don't commit adultery. Here's how you remember that. These two people stay away from these people, right? You don't commit adultery. Eighth commandment, you don't steal. Ninth commandment, you don't lie. Tenth commandment, you don't covet. And all of these have to do with our, our relationship with one another. And so Jesus saying, look, the whole commandment boils down to loving God, loving others. And the beautiful thing that we're seeing manifested in David's life is that 
David's living this out. 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read and saw a few weeks ago, David has this burden on his heart. He's like, here I am, I'm, I'm in Jerusalem, and, I, and I've ascended to the, the, the throne here. I, I, I've got, you know, relative peace all around, and i got this beautiful cedar house that I'm living in, and the tabernacle, you know, the ark of God is, is out there in the tabernacle. It's in a tent. I want to build a temple for God. God, what can I do for you? Seeking first the the kingdom of God, honoring God, loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is David. And God says, David, I love your heart. Man, I I love that you want to build me a temple. Beautiful thing. But you know what? That's not what I called you to do. You, you, David, are your shepherd. What do shepherds do? Shepherds, they watch over the sheep. They they tend the sheep. They protect the sheep. They, 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 They fight off the predators. David, guess what? That's your job. I want you, I'm going to have a man of peace, your son, and broader implication, the, the picture of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that is to come. But I'm going to have your son be the guy that builds the temple. He's going to be, the, the, he's going to be a man of peace that does this work. You're, you're a man of war. Your job is to secure that peace. So, David, you're going to focus on what I've called you to do. And so that's what David does. He obeys God. He does this. And now here he is. He's manifested this heart, this clear, you know, wiring in his heart and mind. What can I do to bless you, God? And now what we read is that the, he's also wired to say, what can I do to bless others? You know, he, he, he looks around and he, he, he says, you know, what can I do? Are there any descendants of the house of Saul that I can bless them? And, uh, and so here we get a glimpse into David's heart. You know, the Bible says that David is a man after God's own heart. And what a great picture here. He's got his priorities straight. He loves God. He loves others. Um, totally an aside from the text here, uh, this, this minor point, but this really ministered to my heart this week. Just this attitude of, of, of taking stock, taking inventory, and just saying, God, you know, what, is there anybody that you want me to bless? God, is there, you know, what are, what are you doing? Is there any, you know, business that I got to take care of in, in, my, in my, you know, horizontal relationships. Uh, you know, Lord, I want to I love you first, my, 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 my vertical relationship, I want to get right, but, you know, horizontally, is there anybody else that I, that I got to deal with? So this is what David's doing. Now, David, at this point, has a really important reason uh, for seeking to bless the house of Saul. Because, and, and we see it there in verse 1, he says, is there anyone who's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? And here's the, here's the, the, the tell, he says, for Jonathan's sake. And see, what David's referring to here is a covenant that he entered into with Jonathan back in 1 Samuel chapter 20. If you're with us when we went through uh, 1 Samuel, uh, you'll remember that this had transpired. What was happening was David... Called by God to be the king when, when Saul just sort of blew it, was disobedient to God. And, uh, and so God's, you know, poured his spirit out upon David. But, you know, God did, did, didn't automatically just pull Saul out of there. Saul was still king. David's just being faithful where God has left him. And so he's ministering and, and you know, just being obedient to tend his father's sheep. Really lowly job. But all of a sudden, man, he, he goes up to follow his father's command to take some, you know, cheese and supplies to his, some supplies to his brothers there and, um, at the front lines, and they're facing the Philistines. They're all worried. They're, they're, they're not going to go against them because Goliath is there. He's this giant, and everybody's afraid, and here's Goliath. He's like, well, I'll take him. This guy's up there. He's shouting blasphemies against God and so on. You guys remember the story. Basically, David goes, he whoops Goliath, and everybody's like, oh, this is awesome. And so David begins to gain prominence within Saul's kingdom. And Saul makes him commander over all of his forces, and he's having great victory, and everything's great, and it's all awesome until they come marching back into Jerusalem, and all the girls are singing, Saul has slain his thousands. And Saul, just you can imagine, just puffed up, just, that's right, that's right, let's hear it, you know. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul's like, "Ah, oh, no, that is not cool. We're not having none of that. So Saul now, he begins to attack David. And David is just running for his life. So David sees it. He knows. He's talking to Jonathan. He goes, dude, your dad hates me. He's trying to kill me. And Jonathan's like, what? No, my dad's like, he's not trying to kill you. He'd let me know if he's trying to kill you. David's like, dude, he's trying to kill me. 
So, so they, they make up this agreement. Jonathan goes, okay, look, you stay hiding here in this field, and I'll go, and I'll check it out. And, uh, and if he really wants to kill you, I'll come back, and I'll warn you that he, that he wants to kill you. But, but, and basically, in the conversation, Jonathan tells David this, look, you're, you're the king. We, you and I both know it. God's, God's called you to be the king. You're going to be the king. And when you're the king, Jonathan says to David, I'm going to be right by your side. I'm going to be serving you. I'm going to be supporting you. Now, Jonathan was supposedly, by all intents and purposes, the heir to the throne. He was the guy that was supposed to succeed his father, Saul, as the next king. But Jonathan recognized what Saul refused to recognize, and that is is that God's hand was on David. And so Jonathan said, look, I get it. And there's, there's there's, there's no conflict in my heart. There's no conflict in my mind. You're going to be the king. God's called it. We can all see it. And I'm going to be right by supporting you, right by your side. And, and, uh, and so Jonathan says, look, I'll go do this, but here's what I want. I want, to, I want to establish an agreement with you. And basically the agreement is this, is that, you know, if something happens to me, if I die, when you become king, don't go after my family. See, because it was, it was a tradition in this day and age, <laughs> you know, quaint little tradition that uh, if one king and dynasty ended and it was succeeded by a, by a new, you know, uh, dynasty, that, that the guy that would assume the throne, you know, this quaint little practice that any of your family members, he'd hunt them down and kill them like a dog. You know, that was, that was the deal. Didn't want any competition. So, so, you know, Jonathan's like, hey, you know that little quaint custom that, you know, everybody always fought? Can you not do that with me? Can we be cool? Can you, when you become king, can you make sure my family's taken care of? And, and Jonathan, or David's like, yeah, absolutely. First Samuel 20, 16, it basically tells us, John, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now, covenant, interesting word. The dictionary defines covenant this way, as an agreement, as a commitment, or as a contract. And the Bible gives us many examples of covenant agreements within the scriptures. We have an example in Genesis chapter 9 where God establishes a covenant with Noah. Hey, look, I'm going I'm to flood the earth. I'm going to judge the earth for sin. But I want you to build an ark. I want you to put the animals in two by two and so on. He has this covenant that he establishes with Noah. Genesis 17, God establishes a covenant with Abram. You know, there what happens is that uh, God has promised Abram, look, I'm going to make you the father of many nations and, and all, and, and you're going to have so many descendants, you're just not even going to know what to, to do with it all, what I'm going to do with you. Now, when God gives him this, this, this promise to Abram, he's an old man. His wife's an old lady. They haven't had any kids. He's like, you know, how are you going to give me kids in my old age, you know? God's like, you know, I'm going to do this thing. So they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and ain't nothing happening. And so finally, Sarah, Abraham's wife, she says to him, hey, uh, look, here's the deal. I'm an old lady. You know, uh, this womb is not having any kids. So I'll uh, so tell you what, I got this handmaiden, and, and you can have sex with her, and you can, you can fulfill God's promises that way. And Abram, being a man, he's like, well, okay. You know, and so they, they start doing this, and, and so they, they have, you know, he has a child by this handmaiden, and God shows up. He's like, that is not what I had in mind. I gave you a promise. You tried to fulfill the promise in and of yourself, in your own flesh. And so God enters into a covenant agreement with him, and that covenant agreement is where circumcision came to be involved. And it's as though God is saying, look, let me, you know, let me take that, that instrument of the flesh that, that you thought you would fulfill my promises with, uh, and uh, let me give you a painful reminder that I'm the one that's going to do what I say. You're not going to help me out here. And so they have this covenant agreement, Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 2, we see the covenant of marriage uh, displayed there and, 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 and exampled there for us. And so over and over and over again, this agreement, this commitment, this contract, I'll have people that come to see me, pre-marriage counseling, hey, we want to get married, and I'll talk to them about the marriage covenant, and I'll ask them a question, hey, do you think, cov- do you think marriage is a contract, yes or no? And people, and people will inevitably, they'll say, no, it's not a contract. And I'm like, okay, now I get why you're saying that. Because, you know, I say contract, you think, you know, smoke-filled room, shyster attorney, something that, you know, you, if I, we can worm our way through this, or we can finagle our way out of this, or whatever. 
And in that sense, you're right. But you know what? Marriage most definitely is a contract. If you doubt that, try getting divorced. You're going to see how much of a contract it actually is. It is a contract. And, and yet, it's not this cheap contract that we think of. It's a, a, the covenant. Man, it's best described by a Hebrew word, which is hesed. And <clears throat> this, this Hebrew word is translated many different ways. Loving kindness, mercy, steadfast love. Uh, loyal devotion, you read all of those different translations in the Old Testament, and all of them is this Hebrew word hesed. And, and basically, the idea behind it is this, this loving, faithful, never-breaking commitment. As a matter of fact, Jesus Storybook Bible has a great translation of the word hesed. It translates it as a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always-and-forever kind of love. And this is what's at the heart of a covenant, is that you have this absolute love and commitment that says, I'm never going to leave you, I'm never going to forsake you, I'm absolutely going to keep my word here. And so, we've got all of these examples in scriptures that, that show us these covenant agreements, look, out, out, out of absolute love and devotion, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And so David recalls this covenant that he made so long ago, and now he's seeking to follow through with it. And so we continue, chapter 9, verse 2, And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Always a good thing to say to the king. At your service, king. And then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now, when, when he talks about this, he says, look, there's a son of Jonathan and he's lame in his feet. And we actually read about this just a few chapters ago in 2 Samuel. Uh, he, he put on the screen to refresh your memory, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it tells us there, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. This is who we're talking about here. Now, the circumstances were this. Jonathan and Saul died in battle. His nurse, the, the, the gal that would watch over him, his nanny, if you will, she, she knows the quaint little custom that, you know, when, when a king dies and the new king comes into power, his whole family gets killed. So she takes this little boy, this little five-year-old boy who's precious to her, and she's running away. She wants to go and hide him away so that he doesn't get killed in this way. And somehow, tragically, she drops the kid. He falls. And, and whether he breaks his neck and has some sort of paralysis or breaks his feet and has some sort of, of, of maiming injury, whatever it is, he can't walk now. He's lame because of this fall. And so Ziba here, he tells David, he goes, yeah, you know what, there's this one guy. Because David's like, look, I, I want to bless any of Saul's descendants. And so is there anybody? He goes, yeah, there's this one guy, but he's lame. He seems to imply, you know what, uh, he's not worth the effort, buddy. He's just this lame guy, you know? He's damaged goods. Now, we're going to see that he is worth the effort to David. David's going to find and he's going to bless him. Why? Well, because he promised Jonathan that he would. See, it's not about the fact that Mephibosheth deserves anything. It's not about that he's got anything to offer. It's not about that he's got anything good coming to him. That he's owed anything. No, David's doing all this because he made a promise to his dad. He needs to keep his word, be a man of his word. Now, let's make a quick application here, and this is the lesser application of the text, but I, but, but I just want to, just, you know, just good housekeeping here, let's deal with it. Like David, we need to keep our promises. We need to be men and women who let our yes be yes and our no be no. And we really need to take a walk with a question that we would ask ourselves, what's my character? What is my character? Do I keep my marriage vows? 
Do I pay my taxes? Am I honorable with the things that are entrusted to me? Do I keep my word? And like David, we need to, we need to be those that absolutely have that wiring that I'm going to be a promise keeper. Also, like David, we should seek out our enemies and seek to bless them. We, we should do that. I mean, even though the world always views, hey, these kings that you replace, any of their families, they're your enemy, they're a threat to your throne, they're a threat to your stuff. David doesn't do that. He seeks out, you know, his enemy, according to the world standard, he seeks to bless them. And so we need to think in those terms. Hey, am I somebody... This looking to be a blessing that, you know, Jesus said, what, what credit is it to you if you bless only those that bless you? I mean, even the heathen do that. But we're called to, to bless those who persecute us. To, 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 to bless those that, that malign us and say horrible things about us. And Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we should have this attitude that says, you know, am I going to bless those that, that are, are really not good to me? We also see here in, in this text, and something just to kind of consider, that we should look for the poor, we should look for the weak, we should look for the lame, we should look for those who are marginalized with the attitude that says, how can I bless them? That should be how we're wired. And we should ask the question, you know, am I wired that way? And Jesus has a lot to say about that. He, you know, in the book of James, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is, is speaking through James, makes it, makes it abundantly clear that, you know, if you see your brother or sister in need and you blow them off, that's basically how it's written in the Greek, you know, if you blow them off and you're like, ah, you know, sucks to be you, good luck with that, be warm and filled, and you don't do anything, he asks the question, how can the love of God be in you? And so, so that ought to be a way that, 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 that we respond, is that David, he's caring for the weak and those who are marginalized and so on, looking to bless them. And he's looking to bless a guy that doesn't even deserve it. That's another hallmark here, that we should be having that mindset. Do, do I, am I going to bless only those people that deserve it, or am I going to look for people that don't deserve it and bless them too? For, not for their sake, but for their Father in Heaven's sake. I mean, everybody's created in the image of God. And, and so all of these are true. All of these are questions that we ought to ask ourselves. And they're great, you know, applications for us to take a walk with. But listen, if we go straight to that in this text, then what happens is we have missed a huge picture of what, what 2 Samuel chapter 9 is all about. Because we, there is a bigger picture of what God is telling us here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And, and, and it's, it's a foundational implication for us. And that is this, that this story that we're reading about, it serves as a graphic illustration of God's covenant of grace with you and me. See, the Bible is divided into two books. It's, there's 66 books all together, but they're lumped into two categories. You've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. And the Old Testament revolves around an old covenant with God. The New Testament revolves around a new covenant with God. Yet you remember a covenant, an agreement, a commitment, a contract. And, and so we have, as God's children, an agreement, an, a, 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 a commitment, a contract with God. And in every contract that God initiates, there are terms, there are parties, there are promises. It's no different than any contract that you will enter to, with, into on this earth. There's terms, there's parties, there's promises. If you don't keep the terms, if you don't keep the promises, then you violated the contract. And so there is the division in scriptures, an old covenant and a new covenant. Moses told the Israelites, he said, And God declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. 
And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time, Moses speaking here, uh, to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you were going over to possess. Now, he's saying, look, here's this old, here's this covenant, speaking of the Old Testament, and speaking of the Ten Commandments, here's this, here's this covenantal agreement, and it's good, it's perfect, it's absolutely, you know, an awesome covenant, but there's just one big problem with that. So we can't keep the terms and the promises of that covenant. You and I have a problem holding up our end of that bargain, which is why, according to the Old Testament, according to the Old Covenant, that there's this huge sacrificial system that God implemented to atone for our sins, for for our failing to live up to our end of the covenant, that we have to make up for the fact that, oh, I I, I broke the contract. I didn't, I, I didn't keep it. And so, so this is the, the old covenant. Now, why would God establish a covenant with us that we can't keep? I'm glad you asked that question. Here's why. Um, Paul tells us the answer to that in Galatians 3.24. I'll put it on the screen. Paul said this, the law, speaking of the entirety of God's law in general, but in, in particular, the Ten Commandments, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. In other words, the law shows you your need for a Savior to rescue you. Because God says, here's my law, here's my standard, here's our our contractual agreement, and its whole purpose from God's perspective is that you come to the realization, oh, I can't keep the law. See, there's so many people, they want to live their life. They want to say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to do everything that I can to live a right relationship with God. And the mindset is, is that if I I can be a good enough boy, if I can be a good enough girl, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to earn God's love and everything's going to be cool. Everything's going to be kosher with me and God. And then, you know, the entrance exam to heaven is, hey, did your good works outweigh your bad works? Okay, cool. Yeah, you've done enough. You're cool, I judge on a sliding scale, and you've done enough. You're not Charles Manson, you know, so you know, you're not Mother Teresa, but you're all right. You know, your neighbor's a piece of work, but you're cool, so come on up. And so there's, there's many that relate to God in that way, and God's like, I don't want you relating to me in that way, so I'm going to give you my standard, and then what the standard is all intended to do is have you get to the place to where you go, well, I'm in trouble here. And God says, I'm so glad you found that out. You are in trouble. And that's why I've sent Jesus Christ. Because he he keeps the standard. He keeps the terms of the covenant. And and, and by placing your faith in him, man, I I can rescue you from yourself, from your sins. Paul said this in uh, Romans chapter 7. He said, I've discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Now, here's an interesting thing. When he says, I love God's law with all of my heart, I can argue with you that even unbelievers, even though they would never admit this on the surface or even consciously think this, they prove that God's law is good and that really inwardly they desire God's law. Even though they would say, no, God's law, does, you know, it's not even real. He's a, he's a sky fairy who does it. He's a figment of your imagination. I don't believe in God. No, but you believe in his law. See, because if you, you know, you buy yourself a nice new Corvette and I go steal your nice new Corvette, or I run my keys down the side of your nice new Corvette, you're going to lose your lid. Why? Because God's law is written on the tablet of your heart and inside you know that's wrong. You stole from me. Or about, you know, I, I, you, know you, 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 you have a, a relationship, you're in a marriage relationship, and some guy, you know, runs off with your wife, you're going you're gonna to be like, that's wrong. Why? Because it committed adultery. And God's law is written on the tablet of your heart. You see, so, so it doesn't matter whether or not you're ready to admit that there's a God or not. The fact of the matter is you can't escape the fact that his law is written on the tablet of your heart. And so you say... They stole, that's wrong. They lied to me, that's wrong. They murdered this person, that's wrong. 
It's God's law that's written that you can't escape, whether you'll admit that there is a God or not. And so, so Paul says, look, I, I want to do what's right, but I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Here's the answer. Thank God the, an the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord God. That's the answer. See, the law shows that you need a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. He came to fulfill the law of Moses. Jesus said so himself. Matthew's Gospel, he said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, Jesus came to, to, to keep the law that we couldn't. He lived a sinless life. Listen to what Paul told the, the Colossians. He says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and your evil actions, and yet, he, yet now he has reconciled you to himself. He's speaking to believers in Colossae. He's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. Let me ask you a question. Has God reconciled you to himself yet? Have you come to the place where you've surrendered to him? Maybe you're here today and, man, you, you hear what Paul would say to the Colossians. Hey, he, he's reconciled you. He's, given you. he's made peace with you. And maybe today you, you would say, I don't have peace. You can. You can absolutely have peace. Every time I talk about peace, and I've mentioned it before, but I always think about Harrison Ford in his interview. You always want what you ain't got. They're like, what ain't you got? Peace. You have peace, you can have that. See, that, that, that's the, the beautiful thing that's offered to us. And so this old covenant required obedient to an Old Testament law, but you know what? There's a new covenant. And the new covenant, listen, it promises that, it, that even when I break the terms of the old covenant, that my sin is covered in Jesus Christ. That even when we are faithless, he's, he remains faithful. Hebrews 9.15 says, That is why he, God, Jesus, is the only one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. So that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance that God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins that they had committed under that first covenant. The Apostle Paul described being set free from sin this way. He says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of charges that was against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. That's, that's, that's that, that charges, you know, when you, st when you go to court and you stand before the judge and the DA steps up and he goes, he's got this charge and he's got this charge and he's got this charge. And Paul says, you know what? God took it all away. You were dead because your sinful nature wasn't yet cut away. But God cut it away. There's a show I love watching. It's, it's called Overhauling with Chip Foose. And uh, he takes these cars and they are just rusted out, rust buckets. And the people are in love with them. And their family members are in on it and they'll steal the cars. But they're actually bringing them to Chip Foose's shop so that he can redo it. And he makes it like this brilliant masterpiece. And one of the things that they do when they bring the cars in, the first thing they do is they strip it completely apart. And, and they'll take the body off and they'll send it to a thing called media blasting, which is they basically sandblast the thing and take, it, take all the paint off and take all the, and it exposes all of this bondo, you know, when your car gets in a wreck and they put this clay putty stuff on to sort of cover over all the dents, you know. And then it's a picture of the way we live our lives apart from Christ. A lot of times our, our life is a junker. You know, but what, but what do I do? I, I bondo my life, you know, with, with stuff. I'm just looking to fill the holes 
of my life. And so my life is filled with, you know, drugs or alcohol or promiscuous sex or possessions or whatever it is that I'm trying to fill the holes in, right? And, and yet what happens is all of that stuff, in order to make that car right, it, it all has to be cut away. Those holes need to be completely exposed. Why? So that God can, can restore us. This is what Paul is saying here to, to the Colossians. And God wants to do that in your life. And maybe today your life is filled with bondo. You filled in the holes with, you know, fill in the blank, drugs, alcohol, promiscuous sex, you know, business achievement or, or relationships or whatever it is. And God says, listen, none of that stuff, it might cover it over. You might be able to slap a paint job over the top of that thing and call it good. But it's a rust bucket. And you know it. You lay on your pillow at night at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. It ain't right. And listen, God loves you. He wants to make it right. And he wants, to, he wants to, you to live under a new covenant. Because he knows that you're not going to fulfill the old covenant. He knows that you're going to violate the old covenant. He wants you to come to the place where you turn to him and say, Lord, help, fill, provide. Now with this in mind, as we look at how David deals with Mephibosheth through, here, through the rest of the chapter, I want you to read it with this understanding that we, you and me, we are Mephibosheth, okay? And so look again there at verse 1. He says, now, now when David says, is there still anyone who's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And, and so is there anybody else that I can show kindness to? Look, just as David desired to show kindness for the sake of the king's son, Jonathan, you need to understand that God the king desires to show kindness for Jesus', for, for Jesus right? For God's son, Jesus, for his sake, not for your sake. But he wants to show kindness to you because of Jesus Christ. He, he, he wants to bless you for his sake. And it's all wrapped up in that new covenant, that, that covenant of grace. It, it, you know, it's not about keeping the law. It's not about doing good and trying harder. It's not about your good works outweighing your bad works. It's about God just wants to bless you because Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. That's, what, that's the fact. He wants to bless you in that way. Ziba tells David, yeah, there's a guy you can bless. He's named Mephibosheth, but you know what? He's lame from a fall. And so also are you and me. We're lame from a fall. The fall is sin. All have sinned, the Bible says, and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We are lame from a fall. And the Bible teaches we are that way by nature and by choice. And so we're separated from God and from, by our sin. Paul told the Ephesians, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath. And the Bible says in the book of Romans that there are many who become slaves to sin. And maybe that describes you here this morning. Maybe you're enslaved to sin. And the thing about being enslaved to sin is it's sin by nature is something that we're ashamed of and we seek to hide. And so maybe today you know that you're enslaved to pornography or to some sort of sexual addiction or to drugs or to alcohol or to, you know, some other illicit relationship or whatever it is. And the fact is God knows it and you know it. And maybe you're enslaved. You come in here, you're addicted, you're trapped, you're ashamed, you're hopeless. But you need to hear this and you need to see this, that God wants to set you free. Is there anyone of the house of Saul that I can bless? Hey, is there anyone that I can bless, that I can show kindness to? That's God's heart towards you. And that's what makes Christianity different than every other religious belief system. Every other religious belief system says this, it's man seeking after God. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. Bless me, God. Listen, Christianity is the only belief system where God is seeking man. Jesus Christ has been called the hound of heaven. He loves you with an unending love. Jesus said in Luke's gospel, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. I wonder if you're lost today. Because he wants to save you. 
See, many perceive God as being an angry God, a vengeful God. It's not true. It's categorically not true. God loves you. He loves you so much he sent Jesus Christ to die for you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And listen to the very next verse. He says this, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's God's heart. He wants to save you. Mephibosheth, he's like us. He needs to hear this. And look where he's living. If you look again there in verse 4, he, he asks uh, this, this servant, Ziba, he says, like, where is this, you know, where's this guy? Where is he? And Ziba says to the king, indeed, he's in the house of, of uh, Mature, the son of uh, Emil in Lodabar. You could circle Lodabar if you're given to taking notes. Nearby, here's what you could write. Lodabar, it means not a pasture. That's technically what it means. I live in not a pasture. Right? Not a pastor, not a pasture, okay? What's it mean by that? Here's the idea. It's a place of barrenness. It's a place of dissatisfaction. It's a place of frustration. Is that where you live? This is where Mephibosheth lives. He's hiding from the, the king, the one who can bless him, the only one who can bless him. He's fearful for his life. He's living in a fallen state, crippled by his fall. And he's barren, not living in a pasture, pasture, not living in a place of fruitfulness. He's just like us, apart from God. And so, verse 5, it says, Then King David sent, and he brought him out of the house of Mature, the son of Emil, from Lodabar, and now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. Now you know in his heart of hearts he thinks the guy's going to kill him. And so David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now I want you to see David offers Mephibosheth four things. First of all, he offers him freedom from fear. He said, don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you. That's not my heart. I'm not looking to kill you. I'm looking to bless you. That's what God says to you today. Look, I don't want to kill you. I want to bless you. The other thing he offers him, he offers him freedom from inadequacy. He offers him freedom from inadequacy. He says, look, I want to show you kindness, not because you earned it. Because the enemy's right there in your ear. He tempts you to sin on this side of the fence, and then on this side of the fence, he's right there. He goes, oh, you can't go to God now, you big fat loser. You think you can, you, you know, people say, you know, hey, I'll, I'll tell people, man, why don't you come to church? They're like, oh, man, if I go to church, you know, a lightning bolt's going to hit there, you know. No, it's not, because it's not about your performance. It's about Jesus' performance on the cross. And this is what he, he offers him. He says, man, you've got this freedom from inadequacy. Get over yourself. You're inadequate. You ain't got nothing to offer me. You're lame for crying out loud. But you know what? Because God is good. Because his son is good and he paid the penalty. Man, he offers you that freedom from inadequacy. The other thing he offers him here is he offers to restore his land, right? This is inheritance that he's offering. This is what God offers us in Christ Jesus, to give us a future and a hope. Not only do you get back what you lost, because these lands are technically his, Mephibosheth's, because they belong to his father, and he technically lost them because of the loss of the battle, and he was running for his life and so on. Not only does he promise to give him those things back, but he promises to give him so much more. That's the fourth thing, the fourth thing that he offers. He offers him abundance. He says, look, you can dine at the king's table. And it's significant. This is the first time we're going to see of four times that he says that. Now listen, when God repeats himself twice in the scriptures, it's very significant that we should pay attention. He doesn't repeat it just twice. In this account, he repeats it four times to say, listen, you're going to dine at the king's table. Imagine, just think with me, what a contrast to go from the land of no pasture to the king's table. That's what he's offering him. I think about the prodigal son. 
Here's a guy, he, he says, yeah, you know what, uh, give me my inheritance early and, I, and I'm going you know, to go. He just couldn't wait to get away from his father. Goes out, blows it all, winds up literally in the pig pen, eating the pig slop, and as he's there, he comes to himself. It's a beautiful story, and I love the language that's used there in Jesus' parable, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He comes to himself. He's like, I'm, I'm here, I'm eating pig slop, and my father's servants eat better than this. Maybe I can go back and just be a servant in my father's house and, and get out of the pig pen. And, and you know the story. He goes back. His dad's watching for him, comes running to him. And I always imagine the father every day just looking longingly down the road, saying, how far can I look down the road? What's the farthest place that I can see if my son even begins to return? watching that place diligently and he begins to see a figure and you can imagine the father and he's like, is that, is that my son? Is that my son? And he gets to the place and you can imagine maybe even the tears start flowing. The father's like, my, my son is coming home. And he runs to him and he just throws his arms around him and that's God's love for you. He loves you like that. And listen, I want you to hear this because if today you're in a place where you're separated from God, maybe like Mephibosheth, you're hiding from God. He brought you here today. He loves you. And that's our beautiful picture here is the heart of the Father wants to bring you back to himself. And he promises you this abundance. You're going to dine at my table. You don't have to live in the pig pen. Verse 8. It says, then he bowed himself, and he said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? I don't, this is just too much. This is too, I don't deserve any of this. This is his heart. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and all of his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat, but Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Second time he promises that. And now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for me, or as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall, third time he says it, eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. Verse 13, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually, fourth time, at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Listen, he still had the scars. He still didn't have anything to offer the king, but that didn't mean anything to the king. He said, look, because of what your father has done, and because of my relationship with your father, you're going to eat at my table continually. Now, I want to notice one final thing here as we close, and this is the most important thing I'll say all morning. The last thing to notice is that Mephibosheth responds. There's a response. Notice what he says there in verse 13. It says, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. Listen, he could have said no. And you can say no today, too. Because in just a minute, I'm going to pray and I'm going to give you an invitation. And if you're here and you haven't been in that place where you recognize I'm a sinner separated from God. And maybe if there's been that part of you that says, oh yeah, I, you know what, I believe in Jesus. But you've really never come to the place where you recognize, look, here's the basis of the covenant. Not that, not, not that you like somehow receive God's grace and favor and eat at his table because of your good works outweighing your bad works because of you know whatever it is that you've done to earn God's love but listen what you need to hear today is you've done nothing to earn his love you're completely lame but he loves you and because of his son he offers to you forgiveness today Maybe today that's you and you need to hear that and you need to come to the place to where you need to make your calling and election sure. You need today to know that when you die that you're going to go to heaven, that you're going to dwell in the king's presence forever, that you're going to eat at his table. 
And if I ask you that question today, do you know where you're going when you die? If, if when you die, you're going to heaven. And if your answer is, I, I don't know, I hope so. Listen, today you need to make sure you need to respond to this. And the only response that is going to do you any good is like Mephibosheth to say, all right, I'm going to dwell in Jerusalem. I'm going to eat continually at the king's table. He responded. And so today I pray that if you need to respond that you would. 